my name is Russell. I've, I've been at Tax Systems for the last uh, couple of years, over two years now, um, and I am the Chief Solutions Officer. My, my role in the business is all around kind of our uh, our move to cloud and our direction of travel from a strategic point of view. Um, as a business, we are investing a lot of money in kind of cloud technology and, and the way that we work in kind of changing uh, our operating model and the way that we work with our customers. And um, I have spent uh, just over 10 years of my life in the big four, um, and then I've done a couple of different roles I'm in tech companies, always around kind of the role of tax technology. So probably nearly 15 years worth of experience in tax technology, which is quite scary when I say out loud. Um, but yeah, that's a bit about me. Um, handing over to the, the rest of the team for their intros. Hi, I'm Vicky Woodford. I'm the product manager for Alphavat. I joined the company in January. I've come from quite a long history of product management in cloud technology. So um, my main role is to be that interface between the technical stuff and the engineering teams and then the rest of the business and the, and the customers. Handing over. Brilliant. Thanks, Vicky. Yeah, so I'm Chris Pankhurst. So I'm a tax technology consultant here at Tax Systems. So my background has predominantly been in VAT, both working in in-house uh, and at firms. Uh, the past few years, I've been working in specifically tax technology uh, within VAT. Uh, so that's where kind of my, my expertise lie. Hi, everyone. Amit Dev here. Um, so I'm senior uh, indirect tax technology lead at BDO. Uh, in a previous li lifetime, a long time ago, um, I developed uh, software. I was a software developer and then somehow for my sins ended up in VAT uh, and never left. Um, and now what I'm doing is trying to mash the two together um, in terms of taxonomy wise, focusing on indirect taxonomy implementations such as AlphaVat uh, as an example. Cool. So um, that's it. We're gonna we're all gonna talk through um, different parts of the presentation. Hopefully, try and keep it a little bit interactive, not just listening to me drone on too much. Um, in terms of what we're gonna cover today, um, it, we're gonna try and get through quite a few topics. Um, a little bit of a recap on MTD um, and and the tax gap. A few recent updates on that. Um, actually, a, a very very kind of breaking news update on on what we call Tax Day, which happened yesterday around legislation. So I'll give a bit of an update on that. Um, we're then going to look specifically at the new MTD for VAT penalty. So the reason that we did this, this webinar was around, you know, a, a new requirement that HMRC put out a few weeks ago. And we'll take you through what those penalties look like. Um, and then we're going to really get into it with, with Amit's view and the video view on this. You know, what does that actually mean in practice rather than just, you know, what are the penalties, but what does they actually mean? That's really important. Um, one of the big things in that uh, was around what they call checking functions. Though we'll dive into kind of what we mean by checking functions and actually show you what they uh, what they look like in practice, um, and then we'll kind of talk about what's next. So uh, we will have time, probably about 10 minutes or so for Q&A at the end. And as I said, um, you know, the more questions we get in, the better. I always like tricky, challenging questions. So feel free to uh, to throw in as many as you like into there, and we'll try and answer them as best we can. Um, so in terms of the recent past and present, and what I wanted to try and do is just set the scene. And this, for anyone that's been working on VAT in the last four or five years, um, they will probably know this like the back of their hand, and it will feel like you've seen this slide a thousand times. Um, you know, we've had different deadlines with HMRC over the course of the last four years. And of course, um, we, we've also had, you know, COVID delaying things. So there was things, you know, things that moved back. But fundamentally, I think when we think about MTD and specifically MTD for VAT, um, it now feels as total kind of old hat. People have been doing this for a while now. So when we think about that, you know, it's, it's absolutely business as usual. People have been doing this for a while. You know, we're no longer doing, uh, you know, webinars on what is a digital link and how to be digitally linked because people know that stuff now. Um, so, you know, this is kind of, I guess, where we've come from. The, the, the VAT penalty regime that came out a few weeks ago felt to me anyway, and this is my perception, is that this kind of felt almost like HMRC saying, okay, this is the end of your kind of soft landing. There was no official soft landing period for VAT, but it felt like this was them saying, okay, you guys have had a bit of time, you've had the rules, you had a stagger from, you know, doing the API to doing digital links to, you know, bringing more businesses in scope. And now this is kind of, okay, we're going to start uh, moving forward. And this is now should be embedded in all the businesses that this is, this relates to. Um, so that's what it kind of felt like to me from HMRC point of view. And we'll talk through those penalties and why, and why that is, um, is something and why we think that. Um, just in terms of the VAT gap, and it was an interesting one, these figures came out um, last week or the week before. Um, so as most of you will know, HMRC put out figures on the, uh, the tax gap across all the different types of taxes. Um, and they put them out once a year to kind of talk about well, how good a HMRC at, you know, using their powers to reduce the tax gap, the tax gap obviously being the difference between 
what HMRC think that they should receive and what they actually receive in their taxes. And I think the, the interesting point for VAT was there was quite a big um, move down. It might only seem, you know, from eight and a half to seven percent. But in terms of there was a move down um, and you can see from the chart, there is a general trending downwards. Um, it went back up last year and their kind of reasons around that were all due to kind of COVID and, and, and uh, timing differences around receipts. But fundamentally, that tax gap's gone down. Um, but the, uh, you know, which is good news. And I think from our perspective is, is you know, MTD is that part of that, um, part of the reason that that's kind of going down over time. Certainly HMRC, I think, would espouse that view that, you know, um, the, the figures are going down because MTD's helping to, to drive that, not the sole reason, but certainly a contributing factor. Um, but of course, when we also then look at the the behaviours that are driving it, and this is always one, if you ask anybody out of the tax profession, well, what's driving, you know, what would drive a tax cap? I don't know why you would be asking that particular question, but maybe you're down the pub and having a bit of a weird time. Um, what's the main reason? Most people will come to, you know, fraud, um, black market, these sorts of things, and it never ever is. But of course, it's at the top is that kind of what we call failure to take reasonable care. And that remains the main reason at the top of the stack. Um, and certainly from a point of view, that 6.1 billion has stayed constant. So it's definitely something when we think about what HMRC are doing, that's something where, um, you know, they will continue to target because it is the biggest behaviour driving um, the tax gap. So when we think about these penalties, you know, clearly the penalties are, are targeting people who are not doing things correctly. And we'll get more into that as we go. Um, and I guess just in terms of where we are today, then, and as I said at the start, we, I think I feel like we're getting away from a market where people are kind of bringing in MTD and people are, you know, that's that's something that they've already gone and done. So what we actually did early, earlier this year was we did some research with a third party, went out and spoke to over 500 professionals in uh, in the tax space and asked them what the valuable features in, in VAT were. And you can see there on the left, actually, um, that, you know, of course, calculations to get VAT right was top of the scale, but actually these kind of data checks and what we're going to spend the second part of this webinar talking about, they came right up at the top in terms of importance to customers. And that was really good to see. And that clearly aligns with HMRC's view that people should be running um, checks in their process. And we'll talk more about that. Um, and the, the last one for me is, you know, there is what we, uh, we, we like to, you know, use some consulting terms sometimes. And I think this uh, kind of what we call the hype cycle, which is a Gartner term, this is something that I've really seen in the VAT industry. I think if you look over the last kind of two or three years, there was a really big peak, um, a, a you know, a year, 18 months ago, people kind of, you know, driving this, uh, driving MTD forward in their firms and in their businesses and doing lots of things with it. And I think then realistically, we did see a six or nine month period where people were pretty fatigued with VAT. Um, but just in the last three, four, five months, I think it's kind of changed my perception from, you know, talking to customers and people that come to talk to us about VAT. It's starting to get people are, you know, the compliance part, as I've said, is kind of behind us. And people are now kind of getting onto that process of, OK, well, MTD is here to stay. How can we actually make best use of this? How can we kind of drive value through our business? So we're now on that kind of upslope. Certainly from our engagement with customers, we're seeing a lot more people now wanting to talk about what are these data checks? How do they work? How can we improve our VAT processes? Not focusing on compliance, but focusing on kind of efficiency and control and other kind of factors that are more kind of, you know, business driven rather than mandatory from, from HMRC. So that's where I think we are today, just to kind of give you my high level view. Um, and the last slide I had on this particular section, this was, you know, this didn't necessarily fit in this webinar and I questioned whether we should put it in, but it was very relevant to the tax profession. So I thought I'll just put it in because a lot of people on the call won't have seen this yet because it only came out yesterday. So once a year, we have what we call tax day. Um, as you can imagine, at tax systems, that's quite an exciting day for us as a business, which probably makes us a bit sad. Um, but fundamentally, that comes once a year. And that's where all, all the kind of draft um, legislation kind of comes out. Uh, and that's the legislation that we feel is going to move that's going to, you know, it's aimed for the Finance Act um, when that comes in next spring. So some of these things won't be new, but it, they're, they're kind of now moving further along that journey. Um, I guess for, for people on this webinar, the main thing was there was nothing in that on BAT, so no kind of news on BAT. Um, but certainly in other areas of tax, there were movements forward. So BEPS 2.0 is a big area. Um, clearly, everyone would have seen the news about the minimum 15% rate that's been um, talked about and, and kind of pulled through at the G20. Um, so that's kind of moved forward. Um, R&D tax is, some, is an area that, again, has had some, um, it got recently, uh, that was that was pulled through in the budget. Now that those changes have pretty much been confirmed. The two main changes being, as, as far as we can tell from our initial analysis, the you know the expansion. Then this was expected the expansion of kind of scope of those 
things that can fall into R&D. So for example, cloud costs, the interesting thing that they've also pulled in, which um, might be news to many people is the um, for R&D claims that people will have to kind of notify HMRC that they're going to be doing that in advance of actually making the claim. Um, and that's a new requirement that's going to come in. So all those things are kind of in, in going into legislation for next year. And then there's some stuff over as well for those who are relevant for, for transfer pricing, um, some standardization of reporting there. So, you know, again, nothing to do with that and penalty regimes but it'd be remiss of me to not mention these things on a webinar with uh, more than 100 people who are associated with a tax profession so more to dig into there happy to pick up separate conversations on that one um so in terms of what these new penalties are focusing back on vat um looking at uh, what the new penalty regimes are and this was as i said something that hmrc put out a few weeks ago um so these are um, the, the penalties here, right? So, and I'll just run through them. I'm going to not comment on, on what they are, and I'm going to hand over to Amit very shortly to talk through his view on them. But effectively, there's uh, there are four new kind of um, things that were signposted by HMRC. So one is that you have to file using digitally compatible software. Um, and if you don't, that can be a penalty of £400 per return. You must keep digital records. You must use digital links. Um, those two penalties, you know, again, these are absolutely requirements of, of MTD and have been since the start. Um, but now there is this new kind of daily penalty that can be applied by HMRC. Um, and the final one, and we'll talk more about this um, quite a lot, is, is around kind of checking functions. So uh, HMRC explicitly stating you must use your software's checking functions. We'll dive into that and that penalty being 100% um, potentially. So um, rather than me dive into what I think about these things, I always think it's best if we can try and get a person um, who's who's not from a software company and someone who works in industry about this. So I'm going to hand over to Amit to give us uh, his view. So Amit, over to you. Thank you very much, Russell. Um, so what I thought we'd do first, is just go through um, just briefly the current main penalties, I'll call them. There, there's a raft of others, obviously, um, but these are the main ones that you may may have come across, hopefully not, but you know, um, I'm sure everyone has uh, at least received some sort of assessment letter of a, of a potential penalty at some point. Um, so in terms of what's already uh, in the legislation, we've got uh, kind of two types really, two main types, which is default uh, surcharges and behavioral penalties. So for the surcharges is more around uh, if you fail to uh, submit a VAT return or fail to make uh, a, a VAT payment uh, in time, then you go into a notice period, and then after that, um, you potentially get a get a get a penalty, which could be between two percent and fifteen percent um, of the VAT unpaid. And then there's um, the behavioural types of penalties, and this is more to do with where you've made an error, for example, on a on a return, so you've underpaid VAT. This could be because, for example, you have um, under-declared output VAT on your on your VAT return form, or you may have over-recovered input VAT on your VAT return form, potentially through a you know partial exemption calculation or some input VAT wasn't proper to you, or what we've seen quite a bit uh, in in our kind of profession is where uh, an invoice has been issued, but it's not a proper VAT invoice and VAT's been uh, being claimed on that. And the types of penalties uh, in terms of behavior wise that, that can be levied depends on um, HMRC's perception. And this is quite important as we go through this webinar really, because at the back of your mind, you might be thinking that your VAT return is perfect. I mean, you know, we all, we all do, um, but you need to really think about how would HMRC view your VAT return process because uh, Pre-MTD, everyone was using pretty much spreadsheets, so you know that was a level playing field. Um, HMRC had had only that in their mind in terms of everyone pretty much is using spreadsheets, and that's that's the standard. The standards change now. If you think about it, post MTD, um, there's a raft of different ways you can um, uh, prepare your your VAT return. There's utilizing 100% software. Um, and some businesses will still be using spreadsheets, for example, and others may outsource their VAT return completely. Um, so now the landscape's a bit different and that perception has probably changed and shifted as well. So what used to work before um, in terms of uh, I'm convincing, so to speak, HMRC may be different uh, going forward. And I should say in the next set of slides, um, you know, the law hasn't been updated yet for this new penalty regime for MTD. So we can't 100% confirm um, HMRC's kind of thoughts around it until the law is uh, updated. 
uh, but you know, uh, based on our past experience, we're able to speculate a bit um, to 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 just uh, open up a discussion really on this. So um, the, the the three types of behaviours that HMRC try and assess against is uh, when there's an error on a back return is has the error just arisen from a from a lack of reasonable care, which I think Russell had on his previous slide, which was the big kind of back gap producer so to speak, of 6.1 billion, um, which HMRC is utilizing MTD as a, as a lever really to try and reduce that gap. Um, so that can be up to 30%. And then you've got um, a deliberate error. So this is going past the reasonable care is where you know, you've, you've, you know that this is an error on your VAT return, but you still submitted it. Um, so that could go up to 70%. And then what's already been mentioned about the 100% potential uh, penalty uh, of extra tax due is where you're getting into the realms of deliberate and concealed. So this is where, you know, you've been um, really naughty now. Uh, you've not only submitted a VAT return with an error on it, and, you, and you've known that, but you've tried to conceal it. You've tried to hide this away mm -hmm. from, from HMRC. So where there is an error, I mean, errors, you can have the most automated process in the world, um, and you know millions of of VAT checks, but an error can still occur. The main point here that HMRC is looking for is how have you behaved in submitting this VAT return leading up to it? All the steps you know leading up to producing your VAT return form and then finally submitting to HMRC. Have you done enough checks? Um, and if if an error has occurred, did you know about it? And if you did know about it, did you let HMRC know. So that's what the behavioral, behavioral uh, pet penalties are, are all to do with. I should say though, having said all this, the current position, um, this, is, this is all going to change slightly. Um, obviously, we're going to talk about the MTD um, specific penalties, but also there's going to be a shift from these percentage-based uh, penalties to a point-based uh, penalties um, from January 2023. But we're going to focus on the MTD uh, penalties for, for, for now. Next slide, please. So um, if you've looked at, I mean, like me, actually, when I first looked at the, the guidance around um, these penalties, if you, if you just looked at it, you might be thinking £15 seems a bit low. Uh, you know, it's not going to keep me awake at night. But um, you need to start thinking about what that actually means and how can that be applied and over how many VAT periods it can be applied against. So if it's just one VAT registration in your group and there's only one MTD um, compliance failure, because there could be multiple, remember, there could be a digital links failure, uh, there could be a submission failure in terms of compliance, or there could be a digital record keeping failure. And those could um, potentially add up uh, and also um, it depends on the number of VAT registrations you have in your business so if you have a corporate group for example and I guess uh, I'm looking more at maybe the, the the larger organizations but if you have multiple VAT registrations in your corporate group um, then the, the penalties will apply um, per VAT registration and from uh, my experience speaking to clients uh, who have corporate groups, they generally tend to have a similar VAT return process. I mean, there's always a difference, but it tends to be quite similar. So if there's a compliance failure in one VAT registration, there could be this could be uh, replicated elsewhere. So you can see these £15 pounds, um, per, per day, that is, uh, could, could add up over a number of years. You know, that's already... Uh, near enough five grand for that registration on one compliance failure. But if you add in multiple and then multiple years as well, because remember when it comes to penalties, um, unless this changes, HMRC can go back. Their statute of limitation uh, is, is four years. So they can go back four years. So if you don't, if there is a compliance failure now and you don't act now and you leave it uh, for HMRC to come, come round knocking in four years time because they always time these things well um, then this could be could turn this 15 pounds a day could turn into something 
quite costly, uh, which is something that could actually be be avoided. Um, I would I wouldn't say completely easily, but but you know there are solutions out there that that could be avoided. Alpha that obviously, bit being one. Um, so so that's that's just putting the fifteen pounds, which seems very very low, even within our uh, VAT practice when we we talked about it at first, but then we started to you know discuss about well let's 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 have a what if scenario here um what could happen if if um, we get into the, the the larger groups for example and multiple VAT registrations so it could it could be significant potentially um and then i did mention the digital record keeping um uh, compliant compliance failure potentially that might might occur so the reason why i mentioned that is uh, throughout my conversations on MTD, uh, one thing that's generally been missed or taken taken for granted is the digital record keeping part of it, because we all think it's all OK in our accounting system, uh, for, for example, because that's where the digital records tend to be held primarily. Um, but one one aspect that is that is in the law is a, is a requirement post MTD is an accurate split of your box six figure. Um, so what that means is you need to be able to, if you have multiple VAT rates um, that you that you that you charge, um, then you need to ensure that your box six can be split between them accurately. And one aspect that we see time and time again being confused, because it's easily confused, because you know why a VAT could be a simple tax, but for some reason it's not. For example, we have the same outcome for three different um, VAT treatments. So that being zero rated, exempt outside the scope. So each present nil VAT, but they are different VAT treatments. And in your box six split, you would have to have those separately to make sure you have that accurate representation. And that's in the law in terms of having an accurate box six split. So what that implies is you should ensure that this, this part of your software um, is generating this split accurately. So, th so that's one to, one to definitely note because time and time again, me personally anyway, for my discussions with clients, this is this is uh, being repeatedly uh, missed. And another point is, even if you had a really nice officer who didn't charge you um, any penalties uh, this time, if they were to check, um, what it does do though is any any VAT compliance failure does put you on HMRC's radar. And if anything, um, they, they could potentially um, scrutinize further. So they may, they may say, okay, you know, we'll, we'll issue suspended penalties. You don't need to pay anything, but then you're put on notice and the next VAT returns might be scrutinized heavily. Um, and therefore, you know, any, any kind of, kind of errors might not be taken lightly as they would usually so that's that's another point to to remember and i did say in an earlier slide it's all about perception so what might look um quite slick to yourselves does it does it look quite slick and robust to hmrc that's a question to ask yourselves really so it's always good to get that outside perspective um i mean obviously i would i would say that but it does it does help um, to get that kind of independent review point, just to make sure um, it, it, the perception it is what it should be. Uh, it represents the accuracy of your, your return process. Another point in the guidance um, that was mentioned um, was the pairing. And I don't know if this was, I mean, it seems deliberate from HMRC because, you know, they could have written this differently, but it seems like what they've tried to do is pair the expectation going forward, and this is the first time they've uh, they've mentioned this, is the expectation to utilize VAT checks in in your software, whatever your software is. You know, could be Alpha VAT, could be spreadsheet, could be another software system, um, could be accounting software. But there's now it appears to be an expectation, and again, I should say this is not in law, but HMRC have put this in writing now, which which officers will look at um, and may have at the back of their minds to expect VAT checks to be available on inspection. So this is definitely one to think about. Um, so 
they've paired this, these VAT checks with potentially levying 100% VAT penalties. Um, and this 100%, if you remember from the previous slide, is to do with the maximum that is usually applied um, before fraud, which is uh, deliberate and concealed um, VAT errors. So now this is just pure speculation. I mean, personally, I think HMRC will remain, will, 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 will ensure that 100% only, only applies to um, concealed and uh, deliberate errors. But, but does the behavior where you're not utilizing VAT checks, does that indicate more than just careless error? That's a question. That's just you know, me, me starting to question what HMRC are thinking here, because why would they pair these two together, really? So that's definitely one to think about. If you don't have VAT checks in your software already, um, then you should really check to see whether um, it's available. It's just not being utilized. And if, if it is available, then maybe you should start utilizing the VAT checks. If there's none, none available, then you should think about whether you can utilize a workaround of some sort offline, um, or if it's time to think rethink your VAT software. Um, so th these are the types of questions you need to start having, I think, in your mind. You've got a bit of time still, um, because in terms of um, when these will, will, will start coming into play, it might be... Um, you know, a, a bit of time, but still, having said that, it's always better to, to act sooner rather than later uh, with a mad rush um, where, where things aren't implemented uh, uh, as accurately, accurately as, they, as they could be. I think that's um, that's that, that slide, and yes, yeah, time for the next one. Thank you. So this is just an example of how the kind of 100% error could, could work. Um, so let's say there was some sort of um, transposition error um, on, on a transaction or a number of transactions. So on a VAT return, instead of using 10K uh, of VAT, um, negative 10K was utilized instead, which could lead to a 20K error. So I, th I think what this is saying is instead of uh, having output VAT of 10K maybe, input VAT was, was, was utilized instead. So you had a, a, an over recovery of VAT. So potential 20K error on your VAT return that needs to be repaid to HMRC. Um, and if it was deliberate and concealed, so this is where you someone has purposely uh, made an error and then tried to conceal it, uh, not tell HMRC. And essentially when this was questioned, try to not tell the truth. Um, so it'd have to go, go to that extent really um, to then probably get to that type of 100% levy of a, of a penalty. Because what then happens is not only do you have to repay that 20K, um, assuming it's not fraud, you'd have to pay another 20K on top of that. So 40K cost to the company, VAT and the penalty. And on top of that, there will probably be interest as, as well. That's not mentioned on the slide, but you know, it, 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 it tends to be added uh, as implied. Perfect. I mean, thank you um, very much for that. I, I've, seen, I've seen a lot of questions flying in the Q&A. Um, I think a lot of people have got a lot of questions for you. So we'll make sure there's time at the end um, to answer those. But thank you very much. And that's really useful to, to get your take on that. So um, just diving in, because this is clearly uh, one of the big areas. And, and for us as a business, um, one of the areas we focused on quite a lot over the last year, 18 months or so. So what do we kind of mean by a checking function? And we're going to get into um, some examples and actually show you them um, from a software point of view. But this was the, the text directly from the HMRC uh, page. So when we send out the slides and the follow up um, to this session, we'll also send the link to the HMRC page where they put this in. Um, but, you know, you can see what checks, uh, what they actually explicitly say. So you must use the checking functions within your software. Um, you must use the checking functions to make sure your returns are correct before you file them. If you can, you should download a copy. Um, if you file a return that contains errors, you'll have to pay back any value you owe, um, and you may uh, also charge your penalty up to 100%. So, you know, it is pretty explicit um, from HMRC. Um, as Amit says, it's not in law, but it is something that's written down. It's something that their officers will use in their kind of day jobs. Um, and therefore, that's why we wanted to, to get into that. Um, and I think, you know, it's interesting, and I can, this is total uh, hypothesis on my part as to why they've gone down this route. 
Um, but what we've kind of seen kind of a before and an after before uh, this was a, you know, this is kind of what, what has happened is that HMRC have had these kind of checks. They've been running their side of the fence. So what happens is a customer submits their return. HMRC think, oh, that return looks odd. We're going to have a bit of a query. They ask for more information. They find that they, uh, you know, in some instances, um, you know, a tax audit, full tax audit can happen. And then invariably, you know, in, in those instances where there are mistakes, they'll, they'll find them and there'll be this resubmission. So there's some back and forth and back and forth that happens. Um, and I think, you know, that we've been working with HMRC on what we call digital checks for a while now. And there's a, there's a press release. I've put a, a screenshot of it in the bottom right hand corner and we'll um, we'll also send a link that, to that as well. But we um, we did a program of work with HMRC that effectively they have the theory that rather than running all of these checks just on their side and kind of holding them behind closed doors, if those checks exist in commercially available software like ours and, and in others, then of course people will use those checks before submission to kind of remove those errors. That therefore reduces that kind of rework loop that um, invariably does happen. Um, so that you know, if I was hypothesising as to why, it's because they've started running these um, these programs of work to prove those um, things out, and we we one of you know we were a, a lucky kind of successful trialist on that, where we were able to prove with HMRC that bringing those checks into commercial software had a benefit. Um, to the kind of the VAT process, and there was very high engagement with that. So that press release is out in the public domain, and we'll um, we'll, we'll link to that as well. Um, so that's why I think they might have come about. Um, and in terms of then what this looks like in practice, I'm now going to hand over to Chris, who is going to show you. So to kind of preface this and give you a little bit of context as to what's going on here, um, we've imagined the scenario of you've pulled your data out of your ERP system. You've inputted it into AlphaVat and you've gone through that process of uploading that and potentially making some edits and changes. <clears throat> so now we can see on this screen that we've got our basic box one to nine that has been generated. On the left-hand side here, if we're talking in the context of HMRC data checks, within AlphaVat, we've got some uh, automated data checks that have been created, uh, the kind of standard and basic across AlphaVat. So those three, which you'll be able to see and identify here, if we go on the 2D review tab, is regarding potentially uh, where transactions have uh, occurred outside of the actual term period, where there's duplicate transactions, or if there's uh, potentially transactions which have an unexpected VAT rate. You also see on the bottom here, I've actually added a custom check, which I'll talk about a little bit uh, later on. But this is really about how we can utilize custom checks to, make, to ensure and mitigate any risk with this process. So within Alphabet, if you were to click here within this section on the right hand side, we can actually drill in to this specific check. And you can see there it was split based on the sales ledger as well as the purchase ledger. So in this case, what we're looking at, we're looking at potentially transactions that have been dated outside of the period. So within Alphabet, what we can do, we can split it and the, the software will automatically highlight transactions that have been uh, kind of detailed outside of that, the, the that period that you're actually going to be filing for. So in this scenario, we can say, okay, we want to mark all of these transactions within that period. And when we go to save and update this, you're then going to uh, see that your box one to nine that we had at the beginning is now going to include those transactions and it's gonna re-update. So now that once this is saved and updated, you'll notice that on that left-hand side panel or contents tree, uh, this check, which had these two transactions that were highlighted is now reduced. So the way we thought about half of that uh, and in the context of a uh, context of these kind of data checks is that we're trying to reduce and mitigate risk. So uh, if we start with 55 transactions that need to be reviewed, we're now down to the, the 53 transactions and it's then getting that level down to that zero value so that we have no more transactions that need to be checked. Also to kind of add to that, any transactions that are updated within Alphabet, within this section, all then feed through into your reconciliation report. So if someone was to come knocking uh, and, and query this, then you have a reconciliation report, which will detail the user that made the change, when the change happened, and what actually occurred. So to highlight this specific check, so we're checking zero, the, the zero VAT rate code. If we open this check up, this is actually a custom check that we've created kind of prior to this call. And what we're actually doing is we're checking that all the transactions that have been assigned to the tax code T0 actually have the 0% VAT rate applied. So this is about, okay, are these transactions incorrectly coded or is the VAT amount actually correct on these? So 
if again, if we want to make sure that all of these are allowed and inputted into the return uh, and included, we can either choose to allow them, or if, for example, we thought, okay, these transactions actually need, need to not be included, we want to remove them or block the BAT element, then we can do that. But in this case, we'll just simply allow these transactions and we'll save and update this. And once again, this is going to feed back in to our box one to nine back in turn, and it's going to update it. So to take it a step back a bit, once we have this load, um, we'll take you over to the actual entity management section where you can actually create your own custom checks. And I think this is very important in the context of what uh, HMRC has recently been, been uh, you know, communicating, that the, the whole goal around this is about mitigating risk. So I, and I'm speaking to a lot of customers, a lot of customers are not necessarily making use of all of these custom checks that can be created within Alphabet. So if we go into the entity details section and entity summary screen, you'll be able to see that once this loads, we have the option to add custom checks. And so these are really bespoke checks that we can add uh, into Alphabet, which is really dependent on your actual uh, data and the columns that you've got in your source data. So what we can do, we can give the, the check a name, we can give it a description, and we can decide on the treatment of it. So we can either choose to report the results. So again, going back to that viewpoint that we had a moment ago, those were reports, but what we can, what we can do is we can actually apply automated uh, treatment to it. So we can either block it or exclude it. Uh, a lot of the time people query whether or not, or what the difference actually is between blocking and excluding. So blocking is where you uh, don't have the bat amounts hit box four on the bat return. Uh, and alternatively excluding is where your uh, transactions are completely excluded from the return. And by using this functionality within Alphabet, you can actually create custom checks based on your data. So you can choose specific column headings and you can then choose kind of the treatment around that. So if we wanted to look at, for example, the tax code, we can say, okay, does it match this value or does it not match this value? So in this case, we can say if it matches T0, and then we can add a rule. And then we can essentially build out these if statements and you can add further ands to further complicate it. So it's really about building out these custom checks and mitigating the risk uh, around those. On top of that, Russell briefly touched on these HMRC data checks. So we do have these modules within Alphabet uh, that have been created, which is around four key areas. And Vicky's gonna talk a little bit about that in a moment. Uh, but to give you a little bit of, of, uh, of an overview how these would work, uh, we've got VAT on UK business entertainment, intergroup transactions, passenger transport, and these car expenditure. Uh, and so within that press, press release that Russell uh, explained, these were the four key areas that were highlighted by HMRC where errors tend to occur. And so what we've done, we've built in these modules into Alphabet, which can then look at your data and then adhere and check uh, your data uh, based off of those specific scenarios. So whether or not you've got business entertaining, we can check that. Uh, and again, if these car expenditure, et cetera, then we can check that. So, I think that was my piece for now. If I pause that sharing and hand over to Vicky, who will talk a little bit more about those data checks in the future. Uh, thanks, Russell. Um, so essentially what we've done with the HMRC data checks is to take our standard checks and expand further into the custom checks and then take it one step further again to identify those four key areas. Um, we worked alongside HMRC to identify those areas and we built templates. So what we would have to do with those templates is map them to your specific data because everybody's data is different and that's the beauty of Alphabet, it can map to your own data. Um, and then you can change, decide on how you want to treat those transactions as Chris has just showed us, um, to whether you want to automatically exclude them, um, report on them, um, and so on. And then at the end of that, you end up with a nice clean VAT return, of course, and you can file it. So we've got those four um, areas at the moment. So VAT on UK business entertaining, intergroup transactions, passenger transport, and lease car. And then what we're going to do is add to that. So if you wouldn't mind, thank you. Um, we the next two on the list are shown on here. So my, my screen's slightly disappeared, so I'm just going to have to change this. Um, so the land and property tax and the purchase of cars, and they will work in the same way. Um, there will just be two additional templates available from that menu. Um, and then we're talking to HMRC earlier this week as well, and they've probably got a couple more that they'd like us to identify in this process as well. So. Uh, two or three more coming out as well towards the 
sort of last quarter of the year we'll be adding these in and that will just again identify more problem areas that so potentially that you can get your tax right effectively rather than um, essentially pay more it's about getting it right um i think that's probably about it for now um yeah and if we need to add more in the future we can do so so yeah. handing back Cool. Thank you, Vicky. And I think it was interesting. One of the questions that actually come through in the in the Q and A um, was a, a question along the lines of: um, we, we use AlphaFat, and there are you know just three three kind of standard checks at the moment. Will you be adding more? Now, of course, we we're we're adding a couple more here, but I think um, we took a slightly different view to a lot of software vendors. So a lot of software vendors will come out and their marketing and say, "Well, we run two hundred checks on your VAT return," um, and actually, our view was that that though you know that's not the right way of doing things because of course in a lot of instances those checks are totally irrelevant to the business um so if you've got 200 checks you can bet that 160 170 of them are, are generally pretty irrelevant and now of course you're being told by hmrc you've got to use those checks so what does that mean do you have to continually look at things that aren't relevant we know from you know customer experience and, and from all of the rollouts of alphabet we've done that everyone's data is different everyone's got a different format of data everyone has different processes around what they're looking for in their VAT returns. So we took the decision to use these kind of custom checks where you can totally make them bespoke to your business. So you can say, you know, our tax coding is this. We always, you know, look for, we have a particular issue where a supplier doesn't ever get coded correctly. So we always have to go and look at that specific supplier and change the VAT treatment. So what we wanted to do rather than kind of building out too many, um, you know, forced checks that might well not apply. There are a few things like duplicates and out of periods as Chris showed. Um, we wanted to make them totally bespoke and custom, and that's what we're now doing. And if we, we, you know, part of that exercise we did with HMRC was to see how many checks our clients were using across the piece. And you know, we're now into the well into the thousands of checks that are being run every quarter using our software on VAT returns, which is great. Um, it's great to see the uptake of those checks, and I think HMRC News will um, will only push that forward. So, um, one last thing from me, uh, a little bit different and a little bit weird for for a VAT. Um, a VAT webinar. I wanted to know, I've always been told that the best thing to do with a, with a webinar um, is to try and make it a bit more human and a bit more real. So this was my view at about 10 past 4 a.m. this morning as my uh, my newborn decided to wake up and scream at me for food and then um, immediately uh, decided she didn't want anything. But why is this relevant and why am I going to tie this back to VAT? Well, uh, interestingly, uh, she's actually had two kind of birthdays this week. On Tuesday, she was 13 weeks old and today she's one week old, which sounds a bit odd. Um, and the reason that's the case is she was born incredibly prematurely. She was born at 27 weeks um, and she weighed two pounds and nine ounces. And um, uh, I've been reliably informed that Tyson Fury was two pounds when he was born. So I'm sure she's going to grow up to be six foot something and a, and a boxer one day. Um, but I think the reason to me that was relevant is that almost... When I think about VAT, the last two, three years, the, the kind of the initial stages are now pretty well behind us. The, 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 you know, the MTD bit, the people where people were going, oh, we need to be compliant. We're going to go and look at, you know, processes and technology and all the rest of it. That's kind of happened now. And I think where we're into is a new phase, a new phase where people are re-looking at processes. We're getting a lot of people coming to us saying, okay, well, we decided two or three years ago that the way we were going to be digitally linked compliant was going to be Excel. Um, and we spent some money with a provider and we went and did some stuff and we decided to use Excel. And then now revisiting those um, those scenarios. So I think we're seeing a lot of that market kind of moving on now and saying, okay, well, well MTD is totally business as usual um, and we need to be compliant. And maybe we are well compliant, but actually we're now looking at the kind of the next phase of how do we do this better, differently, add more value and all the rest of it. So that's how I felt I could tie back the fact that we've kind of been and gone and there's been, we've had almost, uh, you know, in our household, we've had 12 weeks of, of uh, running up to a due date that was passed a week ago. So uh, a little bit different, um, a little bit off the wall maybe, but it's VAT and I've been up since uh, four o'clock this morning. So that could just be my baby brain not working properly. So we're now going to go into questions. We've had a load of questions come through and we've got, I make it 14 minutes to run through them. Um, I'm going to ask Chris and Vicky to play question master um, and ask questions. Some of them are, are definitely... Um, for uh, particular people on the panel, some of them are, are not. So um, over to you guys to pose the questions. Okay, I'll take the first one. So, um, so long as we're using AlphaBridge and submitting the data digitally, is it still okay to calculate your VAT return using a spreadsheet? Does that spreadsheet need to come directly um, calculated from the system or can calculations been done and be done in the spreadsheet? I think that probably lends exactly to what you were just speaking about, Russell. 
Yeah, so certainly um, that's still, you know, there is no difference in what would be compliant. So if your process was compliant before, it will still be compliant today. There's no requirement necessarily to change that. But I, I think what we're, we're now saying is that there are these new penalties that could apply if something changes. And of course, the, the, the problem that we always see with Excel spreadsheets is, of course, if something changes, um, be it, you know, legislation be it that you know your source erp system and tax coding changes and something comes through and it hasn't been seen by the user then uh, or you know or somebody makes an adjustment um at the you know to a particular figure or field uh, that's then not kind of digitally linked or reflected then you can have a process that was one quarter entirely compliant and then by the next quarter almost silently becomes non-compliant without a user necessarily seeing it so that's the danger we always see in excel so while Excel absolutely is 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 in use for for MTD compliance, and we wouldn't be uh, we would be remiss to be saying otherwise, it does carry with it a level of risk. So that's what we would say on on that one. Brilliant. So we've got a, another question here, and it's quite a good one. I think this is more towards Amit. So if you're using a third party software vendor, uh, as an example for uh, Sage, and the box six is not correctly split, although the user has chosen the correct VAT rate which party is to blame? Is it the user or would it be the software vendor? That's a, that's a wonderful question. <laughs> it's, a, it's a challenging one as well, but in the, in the eyes of the law, um, a, a, a business's VAT return is always the, the VAT registered person's responsibility. So irrespective of commercial considerations from a law perspective, it's the responsibility of the VAT registered person to ensure they're that return is accurate and complies with the law. So in this case, it would be the responsibility um, of, of the person who submitted the VAT return to ensure it's accurate. In terms of commercial considerations, that's outside of the scope of VAT. Probably another one for you, Amit. How sophisticated should the VAT checks be? Uh, it's another good question. Um, <laughs> I think Russell answered it quite quite nicely. So every business is, is different, really. There's no, there's no one size fits all. Um, it really depends because if you have, for example, a uh, low transaction count, but um, extremely complex VAT profile, uh, then you'd, you'd have to have complete bespoke checks. But if you have you know, large quantities of, of data, but quite simple uh, VAT profile, even then your VAT checks will need to be bespoke because just the sheer volume of data may mean that you need to have um, some sort of analytics, for example, just to understand what the VAT checks are trying to, trying to tell you. Because, um, you know, you can easily with just one small error in a high transaction count, for example, a date error uh, could lead to, I don't know, a million transactions being an error reported from a VAT check. So it all does depend. Uh, you need to really have a think about um, your your uh, business, what it does, um, and then try and work out what where the risk areas are, because that's what you're testing really, because that's what VAT checks are. You're, you're testing different parts of your, your business um, from a VAT perspective to make sure it's accurate. So unfortunately, I, I don't think there's a one size fits all. There are your basic checks, uh, which have already been mentioned, um, but you really need to think, is that enough to properly test your 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 VAT return from your business perspective? Great. So maybe this one might be a, a little bit more complicated, or maybe to take offline, but uh, it's going to go out to the floor. So our business wants to promote EDI for all transactions. What shall I advise as a tax manager within the business regarding the ditching of invoice copies? I don't agree that EDI meets the compliance, yet I need a solid proof. Can you support with the explanation I can promote within the business? Is that one for the floor or one to take offline? I can uh, I, go for it, Amit. I can start it and then maybe you can jump in, Russell. Um, so, I mean, EDI is promoted by HMRC to some respects. I'm not sure what's meant by it's not compliant. It may be the process in terms of digital links. Um, if it's in terms of digital links, then there is there are solutions available, which ensures a smooth process from EDI in terms of getting that information from the third party um, to then 
make entries in your accounting system or whatever system you're utilizing. So there are solutions out there to, to aid with that. But the good thing about EDI is that standardization and that, that slickness in, in process. So it does save a lot of time in terms of processing. Um, so maybe if we can get a follow up on what's actually meant by not, not complying, um, then that, that then maybe we can answer the question more more accurately. Yeah, one thing I would say, say Amit, is um, if you know if we don't get time to get to your question because they've been continued for again, which is a good thing, um, then you know some of the questions come through as anonymous. If people do have questions following up and want some specific uh, follow up conversation on these sorts of things, if you drop drop an email to inquiries at Tax Systems, that the emails on the um, emails on the screen, then we'll absolutely follow those up. And any questions we don't get the chance to get to, um, as long as we've got people's uh, details and they, they've um, put those in, then we will um, we will follow up directly on those as well um but yeah i think that that, that that's from what i've seen I, you know edi that's that's the right response um i don't have anything necessarily to add to what Emmett said he's got a lot of experience in uh dealing with the very specifics things like that so uh, next question chris vicky yep <laughs> alpha fat has potential checks which can be custom set but only three basic checks running automatically are they sufficient or will alpha fat be introducing more sophisticated standard data checks so um, from a, will we be um, introducing more and are they sufficient? So Amit can probably take the, are they sufficient answer? Um, yeah, sure. So in terms of are they sufficient, again, it depends on your business. So they might be for you. It just depends on how complex your business is from a back perspective. But it's always worth considering, am I, you know, ask yourself a, you know, a, a, an answer honestly, ask yourself the question, answer honestly, am I um, properly testing uh, my business from a, from a VAT perspective and my test in all angles here. That's the main question you need to ask yourself. Okay, and then whether we're adding more, um, it gets a bit tricky when everybody's data is a bit different and in a different shape, um, but we're certainly continuing to look at what data is coming in and which ones we can add as an automatic check. And they'll be run as reports, so you can then decide how you want to treat them after that. So it's certainly one for the roadmap. Brilliant. So next question, uh, probably this one for Amit. Do we need to include out-of-scope transactions under box six of the letter 10? Yeah, so that's a, that's, a, that's a good point there. So technically speaking, yeah, outside the scope means outside your VAT return. So it shouldn't be, but um, most likely your software would probably account for it for um, non-VAT related matters, just, you know, financial accounts. So you would still need to make sure that these are split out that makes sense so they're separated out of your VAT return so that would need to you need to demonstrate that process to make sure you're not um for your own sakes really over inflating your box six figure oh, i've got a quick question one of the ones that's come through for you actually as well and i think um how how do hmrc know so you know clearly they're saying you've got to use checking uh functions in your software how will they know that you're doing that yeah that's a good question because um I think HMRC are still quite far behind the rest of Europe, for example, who can do these checks remotely and in an automated manner. Um, so I think, and this is speculation again, but this is based on experience that we've seen with HMRC dealing with them. They'll probably do um, some sort of check-in process in terms of um, testing your VAT return, maybe doing inspections. And one of the questions might be, take us for your VAT return. So ask yourselves, how would someone um, check whether you've got digital links in place if you do have multiple software packages. The way we do it when we speak to our clients is we literally ask the client, we, we go, go through a walkthrough with the client in, their, on their, in terms of their VAT return process. So they will take us through step by step how the VAT return is produced. And I imagine HMRC would probably look at a similar process. Um, I mean, if you look at their, their system maps in their MTD guidance, it's clear that their thinking is very aligned because we have we started doing the maps before HMRC, obviously. Um, and HMRC, you know, cottoned on that this is a good process to utilize. So that's probably what they'll start doing is start asking more detailed questions about the process of producing the map return, which they didn't do before. Um, and then part of that, an easy question will be: show us your VAT checks. Um, where are these documented? Because it does say in the guide, the new guidance for penalties, um, if you can um, download your VAT return 
when it says if you can, it kind of means please do it, <laughs> if, if that makes sense. So I think there is an expectation to to be able to 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 look at look at the VAT checks retrospectively. Cool. And I think we've probably got time for one more question. So Vicky, Chris, pick pick your pick your favourite, and then we'll I'll answer that, and then um, answer the others. Uh, we'll follow up uh, after the session. A uh, quick one here, are the checks available in Alpha Bridge as well? And the answer to that is no, it doesn't calculate the VAT. The Alpha Bridge is simply a bridging and filing software. Cool, Any, a, a final one from you, Chris, if any, if you've got any other standout questions. Um, sure, there's one here which details what needs to be mapped to be able to run these custom checks. So this is probably one for Vicky or Russell. Vicky? So to run the checks, um, you need to um, map, uh, it depends on what check you're, um, you want to run, whether it's one of the HMRC checks or whether it's a custom check itself. And it's about those questions as Chris showed during the demonstration is, what is it I want to check? What, um, whether it's a tax code or an amount or whether it's identifying certain types of um, transactions from their description and then what do you want to do with it? So I've identified it and then do I want it to be more or less than a certain amount? Do I want it to match a certain set of criteria? And then once I found those transactions, how do I want to manage them? Do I just want to report them so I can then manage them manually? Do I want to exclude them? Do I want to um, block them? So it really does depend on your data and the questions that you need to ask of the system. Cool. Well, thank you very much, um, everyone. Thank you very much, especially to, to Amit um, for giving up his time from BDO. Really appreciate your, your insight and, and thanks to everyone for dialing in. Um, as I said at the start, we will send over um, slides and everything in the follow-up in the, in the coming couple of days. Um, and, and as we've got on screen, feel free to get in touch. Um, and yeah, uh, that concludes the session. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.